Hey everyone. Okay, today we are going to go over beginning to end how to make a pair of cute skull socks. Look at those. These socks right here were made using Patton's Croy Sock Fix. That's this base color. They didn't have a white, so I was able to find the Premier Serenity Sock. Now, one thing, if you look at both of these, where's it at? Okay, sorry guys. They are both considered a number one super fine yarn. But, if you hold it up like this, like if you feel it, the Croy sock yarn is slightly thicker than the Serenity. So when matching collars like that is very important, and I will show you some examples of where I failed. Um, not failed, we will say design embellished. Alright, so with this one again, this collar right here, here for the skulls, the toe, and the heel was some Patton's Croy. I don't remember the exact colorways. They have all kinds of wonderful, wonderful sock yarn that I absolutely love. I use a lot of theirs because it's a thicker sock yarn. Um, it's a wool blend, so it's very, very warm. And it's 75% washable wool, 25% nylon. And it has just incredible durability to it. So big, big fan. Now, when buying your sock yarn, let's say, for instance, the situation I had with this one. The white is thinner than the other collar. I did both socks the same, so it didn't matter. I did run into a problem with these. Um, both the socks are the same size. Luckily, I do need to wash both of them again, but when they were washed, they were the same size. This fuchsia collar is actually a wonderful cashmere yarn that somebody gave me and I was so excited about. And this other here is, it was a gift as well. It is, they are both considered a number one super fine yarn, but this one right here, this is like a cashmere blend. This is a wool blend and it's a little thicker, just like in this. But in this one, you can see a gauge difference. That is the same number of rows here as here and the funny thing is just my counting and everything it just happened to line everything up because the way I switched back and forth so I was lucky on that aspect so you do want to gauge see this one even the cashmere shrinks up more so looking here it looks like it's smaller but once it's on the foot they actually will stretch out to the same size so I really lucked out because I could have ended up with two completely different size socks that nobody would be able to wear and then I would be very, very sad. But there's a lot of fun ways that you can mix your yarns up. You can do everything the same color and just the skulls a different color. You can do one set of skulls. You can do two sets of skulls. You can do three sets of skulls. You can do three and a half. This one should have been four, but it's three and a half. You can create this however you want, and that's what's awesome. Some tips to help you get both of your socks to match. You're going to notice on these, especially throughout the videos, you're going to see pins in different spots on the socks. And what those are is I am marking certain rows. So this would have been 50 rows, this would have been 60 rows, and this one would have been 50 rows and 60 rows. That was just a way for me to keep track because I wanted to make sure I had the right sizing. In the video description below, you will find some videos that will help you with gauging. The one thing that I absolutely cannot stress enough is when you gauge your swatch, which the video describe will explain all that, make sure you wash it when you are done because your socks for instance this sock has been washed and blocked this one hasn't there's you know a difference in the look like this one's just kind of like all folded up and it looks weird but once you wash it lay it flat to dry if you have a sock form you put it on your sock form it makes a difference i'll show you this one as well 
See how nice and uniform and everything this one is? This one has been washed and it set overnight on a sock, uh, a sock form. This one has not been washed. You can see how it's all tight up here. And you'll notice the sizing looks a little different. You don't want to go with the gauging of your swatch when the item is dry before it is washed because some, some fabrics, some fibers will stretch. I noticed with my cashmere, the fibers did not stretch barely at all. But with the wool, it did stretch a little bit. So it's going to vary from fiber to fiber, how it's processed and everything. So always, always, always swatch. And I know this is something that nobody wants to hear, but it's important, guys. You just need to do it. Okay, so grab your loom, grab your yarn, and let's get started. I really, really want these socks to match up. So I'm actually using two looms, which I had to get two of these sets, but that's perfectly fine because if I'm making men's socks, I can make two at a time as well. That really does help so that everything is symmetrical. But with these awesome skull socks, which I'm so excited, one is going to be a negative of the other. What that means is whatever's pink on this one is going to be gray on this one. Whatever's gray on this one will be pink on this one. So I'm going over that one. There we go. You are bringing the yarn over top of the pegs. And you're doing this zigzag motion. I'm not going to go all the way down. I'll just show you most of it. When you get to the other end, it does get a little more difficult because you're kind of going going like this some um, but that's that's fine as long as you're bringing the yarn to the top side of the peg and then just going across and catching that next peg okay, all the way down I will show you right here at the end I'll undo a couple of the last ones okay so we're going over top going over top over top over top over top and that leaves you with one left and for me the yarn is going in this direction so now I'm going to do one row all the way around and stop back here with a flat stitch and actually if you mark this peg because this is going to be the end of your first round you might want to mark this peg so you can remember uh, which is your first peg now flat stitch, flat stitch or U-stitch, whatever you prefer. But basically I'm holding the yarn over top, knitting off. Now do be careful because your first few rows will be a little loose doing um, this part right here. I'll hold it. See, like if it comes off, it can make the whole rest of this unravel. Right. Do that all the way around one time. Before we get started on the toe, which I'm going to do on this side of the loom, we need to put a string over top this Kitchener cast on just to hold these stitches out separate for when we tighten this up later. So you do want to use something that's uh, it's contrasting. Now since my toe is going from here to here, these are kind of like a corner one, I'm actually going to run the string one behind that. What I'm doing is my crochet hook too big? I don't think it is. So I'm just taking a crochet hook, pulling it down on that side. Like I said, this is so, so, so long. 
way longer than it needed to be. But here we go. You just tie that. You can tie the knot bow, whatever, it doesn't matter because this is going to be removed later. Although these extra strings hanging off could get in the way, so. There we go. I'm using a reinforcing thread while I work. So if you're using one, this is how I add mine in. It's so thin, I double it over and put it on the last peg that the yarn is coming from. Kind of twist it together a bit. That way it just kind of appears to be one strand. And then you just start your flat stitch. You just work your flat stitch when you get to the ends just kind of keep working if they're sticking out you can cut those out later but you are going to work this is where you started you're going to work over to this peg right here and then I'm going to show you how to do your decreases okay. this is our last stitch here and this is actually the first of our decrease so you're going to lift the stitch off the peg put the working yarn behind it and put that stitch back on which that's our initial now we got to work back to this peg so you're going to run this the yarn that's behind this peg over top of it and you will knit that second one so this right here will have two separate stitches on it this will have one and then you just work back to the other side Just work all the way over to here. Okay, so we're over here. Now we will do our decrease. Pull the stitch off. Working yarn behind. And you put the stitch back on. And see, you run it in front. It's going to kind of bunch together some, but you can go like that and see that it's two separate stitches. work down to this stitch right here I'll show you how to do your decreases a couple more times this was our first decrease so now we're going to decrease the one right before it so again you lift the stitch up put the working yarn behind the stitch and then replace it yarn in front of that peg and then you flat stitch back to the other side. You're going to go back and forth like this, decreasing one every row until you have nine pegs on this side and nine pegs on this side that have two stitches on each one. The decrease is done and here is what you have now we got to get to here we got to do our increase and then you'll start seeing the indent for the toe the increase is actually really simple it's basically the opposite of the decrease you increase one every row now I know the darker colors harder to see but this was my last decrease so this one has the two over I just haven't started working back this way yet so I'm going to work to the first peg down here on the other end that has two stitches on it almost there oops dropped a stitch drop a stitch Pick it up quick, quick and put it back on the peg. Okay. First peg right here. First peg right here with two stitches on it. Try to separate those out so you can see. And if you're not sure, it should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
Now what we're going to do is we are going to take both of those stitches over top the one. You want to kind of put a little more tension on that than some of the rest that helps to close up any little gaps. And instead of running it in front, you're running it behind the peg and then you work back. Oops. All right, it's behind the peg. Then you work back to the other side. Okay, over here, first one with two on it. I'm going to wrap around it. Take this bottom over the top. Yarn comes from behind. And then you work over here, pick up the first one, and then back, pick up the first one. And you do that until you have all nine on both sides uh, worked. Just like this, and then on this back side, that first row you got to be very careful with. Just do it very slow. Make sure you don't pop any of the other stitches off. Might help if I do it to where you guys can see it. So you just do it very slow. Try not to pop any of the stitches off. Try to make sure it's kind of loose, or else your uh, Kitchener, when you tighten it up, might be a little bumpy. You do four rounds on your fourth round somewhere on this back side this side right here you want to stop and cut your string about five inches long like I've done here see like once that gets down you can kind of pull it and count you'll be able to count five there uh, one was part of the cast on the other four was the extra four that we did so when you get to that point Cut your string, I'll show you how to join it, and then you do the body. Now we switch yarn, which you'll see this side over here will have five stitches. This one you're going to see four, because um, we haven't finished that side yet. But there are so many different ways you can join the yarn. Since I'm using reinforcing yarn with mine, I'm not going to do a Russian join, which is kind of my favorite join. I'm going to do something a little different. Just kind of loop the yarn together like that. Now I want this join to be on the bottom of the sock. But see, I'm just folding it over and holding it. And I'm working a few stitches with both. The first couple I'm going to have to hold a bit since that one side is loose. So see, there's going to be like two. There we go. And there. And there. Now I will go back in with a crochet hook and weave this in later. But see now, I don't need all this extra string here. This should be plenty. And just like I did before, I'm going to kind of twist that together treat it as one and at this point you just work in the round until um, you get to your heel point. okay so so what mine looks like I've got the body done uh, you should have kind of like this mess down here with your string separating it out. We will deal with that later. You've got your four rows of your gray. Then you start into your pink. And for me, it was 65 rows. So I kind of count along. I marked row 50 and then I counted up and there's row 60 and then I went to 65. As you can see, I cut my yarn. Now we do the heel. One thing I did a little different is I personally need a little more space for my heel. I've got wider feet. Uh, so instead of doing the heel exactly like the toe and starting at these end pieces and then doing our decreases and then doing our increases, I actually moved 
four more stitches. So now we are actually using 33 stitches for the heel. So the heel will go from here instead of here to here instead of here. Alright, let's get started. I'm going to start the heel over here. I just fold my yarn in half so I just have a loop since it's so thin you're not going to notice. So I put my loop here. I'm going to be doing my flat stitch. See there's that end one. There's the one and two past it. But like I said before, kind of twist this together and flat stitch all the way around to the two past this corner one right here. Okay, you can see I went from this peg to this peg. Now we're going to go back and start our decreases. Now we're not going to actually start it. We didn't decrease this one because that's sort of part of the, uh, we'll call it the cast on for the heel. So flat stitch all the way to one, well, to two before your last. We are on this peg right here, two before our last. Now we're going to decrease this one, not that one. This one right here, which it'll have double strands on it just because it was where you cast that on. So you can kind of pull that and you go over to the other end and decrease that one. All right, so I lifted that stitch, put the yarn behind it, I decreased it. Now we are going to work back. You're doing the exact same thing you did for your toe. You're going back instead of decreasing this one. It's already decreased. You're going to go one ahead of it. And counting from this one, you'll decrease 11. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So you'll decrease in 11. We have our decrease done, which I'll go over it. You will have, this was part of that heel cast one. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven on this side. The part of that cast on one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this one has been decreased. I just haven't knitted past it, so that's number eleven. Now we will do our increase. And we will increase 11 on each side. And the increase goes the exact same way. I will go ahead and demonstrate it. You flat stitch all the way to your first stitch, which will be your 10th uh, decrease, sorry, your 10th decrease on whichever side you're on. So flat stitch to this one. Okay, I flat stitched to this first one that has the two stitches on it, which is your 11th decrease. Take both stitches. Now, if one's tight, you might have to pull them over one at a time, but you take both of those over, and then you're going to go back the opposite direction. Now, a very common issue with socks is getting holes through your decrease in your heel corner. There are a few different ways you can uh, try to fix this. One thing I found is on your heel, try to use a little tighter tension than you normally do. Not so tight that it's going to break the string, but when you're doing at your decrease and increase parts, kind of like pull the yarn a little tighter and that will help close those up. But you will flat stitch back over to here and you will flat stitch this one and then you'll go back each time just like your toe. You're picking up one more and do all 11 and all you should have left is one on each side, those cast on ones. Here you go, this is your heel. Once it is done, it's right here. Now 
Now you need to switch your collars. Just cut a few inch tail. We will deal with this and weave this in later. It happens to be on the same side as this so that actually helps. We are going to add our pink yarn in. Okay, and here's where our yarn was ending. So we're going to start at the same place. Remember we have one gray stitch left because we didn't decrease those. So you go ahead and knit that one off. And now you go in the round for 10 rows. Before we do the skull chart, I'm going to show you how to tighten up the toe. So you want to find your tail and you're going to start at the other end. This string will come out. It just kind of gives you a guide to help you tighten up the right ones. And you want to go in order. Now if you do have an animal fiber yarn you are working with, you do want to watch because it can felt and it is a little more likely that it can break on you. So uh, if I come across any of those problems, I will show you how to deal with that and fix it. But the best thing to do is just go slow. So as you can see, here is my first strand. See, it's pulling that way. I don't want to tighten that one up. So I pull it the opposite way. And what that's doing is tightening up that very last stitch. So then you find your next stitch and you pull it in the way that is tightening behind. Because one way, it'll pull the strand. That's why I'm keeping my finger here to, holding, to hold them separate, sorry. I'm gonna do a few of these with you so that you can see the results sort of turning out here. It's really neat. This is my favorite way to do socks. The See, look at that. If you do it right, it is completely seamless. It just looks like those stitches. You can't really tell. Now this will get longer and longer. The longer it gets, the slower you're going to want to pull it through. Less chance of snags and breaking and the not fun stuff that we don't want to have to fix. Here. See how that is? Isn't that awesome? I'm going to work ahead and I'll show you how to finish it up. I have made it to the other side and I'll show you. Some of them I didn't pull quite as tight, but once this is washed, it will blend in almost seamlessly. Uh, when you get over to this side over here and you're tightening them up, just be very careful. This one can be a little harder to see what goes where, but you know you're at the end when you can pull the string and it's tightening this up. Sometimes if you notice it's balling like it just did, you can take, kind of put your finger in between it. Pull this all the way through. It you wanna watch, make sure it's not snagging. Almost. Okay, now before you tighten this, run this strand through it. And it's a long strand at this point. Run the strand through that and then pull it tight. Leave enough to weave in and you cut this string or untie it however you have it, just pull it out and your toe is done. 
Okay, we are at the point in the project where we will be doing the chart. I do want to quickly go over how to read uh, the chart, graph, whatever. Now the PDF will be rolled up where it will all be rolled out and you'll have the graph. So you can follow whichever you find to be easier for you. I'm not seeing anything else. So I'm just going to use the bottom of a sock. Okay, first of all, you go from left to right. Every row will be from left to right since you are working in the round. And so you start with row one and the empty ones are your background collar, which for the sock we are working on, that would be your pink. The X's are your foreground collar, the skulls, which will be the gray. So you would work all the way around the loom following these, you know, every counting from peg one to 18, which you already have your pay, your you'll have your loom marked out, which makes it so much easier. So that would be your row one, which I will work that one with you. Then you go down, and for the second row, you would have two pink. Then you'd have gray. You'd have three pink, then a gray, and then you'd just be following that. Now, as you go on, there's going to be more and more gray as you get further along to see the skull and as you can see this is upside down but you're doing one row at a time so you're doing one row at a time working it upside down and you will eventually this is how it will turn out now I do I use I have some stickers I use things to separate my rows out so that I don't get confused one part that you really really need to pay attention to is row 10 and 11 because they're basically the same and if you're not paying attention you can end up accidentally repeating one of these rows I done it like three times um, definitely pay attention uh, it's not fun to take apart so you will follow it from left to right top to bottom and then when you get to the bottom you just automatically go back up to the top. So row 1 and row 20 are the same as row 10 and 11 to where you only have their complete negatives of each other and it can be a little easy to um, forget which one you're on. Okay, so let's go over row 1. I will show you how to tie in your floats, explain the floats, and how to switch your collars. We need to add in the skull color. So, what I'm doing is I'm just looping it around the pink. Just kind of holding that in there. And let me see. So, I have this peg right here. This peg right here is considered your peg one. So if we go to the chart, peg one, two, and three is empty. Then four, five, and six will be your gray. So we need to do our flat stitches on peg one. And there's two. And then three. The grays in there, we've done peg one, two, and three. So four, five, and six, like the chart shows, will be the darker color, which is, I'm using a gray. Now what we're gonna do for this is we're gonna kinda have to, what we're gonna do for this, we're gonna kinda have to anchor this yarn in as we go so we don't have these big, long strands showing up in the back. So we want the gray yarn to go behind it. And I just doubled it over because that makes more of a more secure, um, it makes it a little more secure so it's less likely to come undone. So one, two, three, we got four, five, and six. Now, for this one, 
this row, there's a lot of twisting in your floats because four, five, and six are the only pegs that are going to be gray for this entire row. And in the next row, only three and seven will be used. Then it's going to get uh, quite a bit easier with uh, the floats. Okay, so, so we got six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then this whole section is going to be empty, and then we're going to start putting the gray back in over here. But right now I'm going to show you how to tie these floats in. So put the gray on top. And I'm going to tie in the floats every three stitches, which all I do is I put the gray in front. You're basically twisting it in. Now see how I have two strands here? That's worked through a bit, so I'm just going to tuck that down in there and we'll weave it in later. So we have the main string coming from the yarn right now. So you twist it in front. This whole section is empty. And twist. Twist. Okay, so we're back at our peg. This is the end of the chart, so this will be peg one, two, three, four, five, six. So we got peg one done, which that's three, so we'll twist that around. So two, one, two, three. Have the pink in front. Take four, five, six, and again, the gray will go in front since the pink is the next collar. So one, two, three, you hold that in front and twist it over. One. Okay, I'm going to stop there and kind of show you what the inside's looking like. Now, I'm going to fold it. I'm going to flip one of these other socks inside out so you can kind of see what the inside's going to look like. The yarn you're twisting is this back here. Now, if you're using a wool or an animal fiber, most likely over time, this will actually felt and become a lot softer, which is really nice, but you do still want to make sure to hand wash them. You can kind of see the skull shapes too, which is kind of neat. That's why we were twisting these, because if we didn't, we'd have long strands coming across and you would get your toes and stuff stuck in them as you were wearing them. So what we did, because I would keep doing that until I got back to my first peg, which I've got marked. What we did is just this row right here. Row one is complete, and I'm going to kind of, well, row one of the skull charts is complete. So I want to kind of give you an idea of what, you what it should look like. You should have three, and then this spot's empty. One, two, three, and then you have three grays. Then this spot will be empty. And again, you have the three, and then empty. So you should have one, two, three sets of the very bottom part of your skull. Now for the next row, and this one's a pretty easy one to remember because when you come to the grays, you actually, it'd be opposite. So this one would be gray, these would be pink, and this one would be gray. 
and you just follow along and when you see these ones you know the first one and the last one here are gray and these middle ones will be the pink or of course whatever colors you're using at this point you just kind of keep working following your chart you can make it you can repeat this chart as many times as you want now for this sock for the mate I did there's one two three and a half chart repeats so there are three and a half chart repeats which basically means I did it one two three and then I stopped here in the middle just for this one just because of the length that I'm making that one for someone specific or else I would have ended up finishing out the chart so what you do is you follow the chart repeat it as many times as you would like and then show this up close you do one two three four five rows of your background collar which on this of course will be the pink and then we will do our two by two ribbing for the top but I will show you how to do that when we get there my charts are done as you can see as it came down it stretched out and made it a lot easier to see the designs because if you look up here as it's first coming out that's not how it's going to look so don't worry I did my five rows of the flat stitch right here that's just to give a little bit more of a space between the skulls and the cuff and what we are doing is a double rib stitch it's knit two purl two knit two purl two all the way around but first you go ahead and change your collar out which I did I changed it out just the same way as I've been doing through the whole project and I'm only doing the cuff part with the gray this one I did it with the pink what you want to do is you want to go ahead and flat stitch one row around so that there is just a seamless transition from one collar to the next I did one row of gray and it's just the flat stitch it is nothing different now we do our knit two purl two if this is something you will have trouble remembering you can mark your pegs but the knit two we have flat stitch flat stitch that's the stitch we're using for our knit stitch and the purl two okay for purl you take the hook down through the top and pull the stitch up through the bottom take that old loop off put the new one on there are better video tutorials on how to do the purl stitch if you do need more help Oops. so there's my purl two and the purl stitches are these inset ones those are your purl stitches we got a knit two and then you do a purl two oh, wrong way. so you got I'm doing knit two purl two knit two these two will be purl knit purl knit all the way around and you are going to be doing 19 rows because counting your first row here it will add up to 20 rows all together so go ahead and do your 20 rows and then it's time for the cast off it is time to cast off we have our 20 rows of the gray now to do the cast off I'm going to use what is called a basic cast off there's basically three steps step one you e-wrap so you can wrap around from the back around the front you e-wrap two pegs and knit off step one step two the second peg which is the peg the working yarn is coming from you remove that stitch and put it on the first peg and then knit off step three fill in the gap so we do step one again you 
you're going to have an empty peg. You e-wrap the two pegs, knit off. Step two, working yarns coming from peg two, you're going to move that to the first peg, knit off. Step three, fill in. After each three steps, you're going to end up with one more empty peg. Always just consider this first peg is peg one. It's going to be the peg the yarn is coming from. So I'll show you one last time. Step one. Step two. Oh. There we go. And then step three. Now this is your cast off, so you don't want to do it too tight. Go all the way around, and I'll show you what to do when you get to your last peg. I am down to the last two pegs, and you're going to do this exactly like you did the rest. Step one. And step two. But there is no step three. What you do, cut your yarn with just, you don't have to have a whole lot, just enough to weave in. And then take that, you take the tail, pull it through the loop, then you can just take it off the loom. That loop locks that in. Then what you're going to do is you'll take your crochet hook, weave in the end there, pull the string to the inside, and you weave all your ends in and then cut them off. Once that is done, then your socks are done! <laughs>